Okay, well, look, I think we'll get started. We are recording today's event, so do pass on to colleagues that if they're unable to join us or join late, that they will be able to access um, the recording afterwards. Good afternoon. It's great to be able to bring us all together for this vitally important an urgent topic. So thank you for making time to join us this afternoon. My name is Alan Wood. I'm one of the directors and co-founders at Evidence for Learning and Learning Shared. I'm going to keep the introduction to a minimum just to quickly outline the format for the next 90 minutes. I'll, I'll shortly be introducing Professor Barry Carpenter, who is chairing today's discussion. And after some opening remarks, Barry will introduce Dr. Tina Ray for her main session. Um, after Tina's presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. So please use the Q&A tools within the Zoom webinar interface to post any questions. If you can avoid using the chat to post the questions, that, that'd be helpful because uh, sometimes can be quite tricky to pull out questions and post them into the Q&A, but please do use the Q&A. We don't want to get your questions lost in the information stream of the chat. Uh, that said, please do use the chat. I can see people are already using the chat to introduce themselves. Uh, there's 290 and counting participants uh, in the webinar. We've got a fabulous network and a, a wonderfully diverse group of colleagues joining us today. And I always think these events are a, a, a wonderful opportunity for us to network and make new connections. So please do use the chat to its fullest potential. As I mentioned earlier, we are recording today's event and we'll be placing the video on the main page that you would have used to register for the event. I've just put it up on the screen now. Uh, if in doubt, if you go to the Evidence for Learning or Learning Shared website, there'll be a banner link on the homepage that will take you to this page. And on this page, we'll have the video will be uh, streamed and we'll also have some of the fabulous resources that Tina's created and shared with us all. Uh, they'll be available to download as well as some of the links to websites and resources that Tina is going to be sharing during her presentation. For those of you that are interested as well, um, if you're on our website, you, you can also find details of a new program of CPLD that we're launching at the end of this month. Both Barry and Tina have contributed to the design and the development and uh, production of some of the resources in this program, uh, along with uh, a number of other colleagues, including Diane Rochford, uh, Vegeta Patel, Alistair Crawford, and many others. Um, in addition to a, a comprehensive treatment of the topic of well-being, there's modules that are looking at uh, inclusive models for curriculum, uh, assessment, pedagogy, leadership, and a range of other topics. So um, you're very welcome to browse and look into that while you're on our website as well. And so with that, it just really remains for me to say that I hope you find the next 90 minutes informative and helpful. I'd, I'd like to thank Tina for um, uh, putting this together. Tina reached out to me literally three, four weeks ago and said, look, we need to do something and we need to put on an event. And I really would like to uh, applaud Tina's generosity really in, in stepping up and creating this opportunity for us all. And also to Barry, who uh, immediately jumped in and said, look, he's going to help out as well. So I'd, I'd really like to say a big thank you to you both. Um, and so with that, I would like to hand over to Professor Barry Carpenter. Thank you, Alan. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's uh, really a privilege to be able to be part of this afternoon's webinar. Uh, I do want to thank Alan and his team at Evidence for Learning who have given of their time and talents to offer us a platform to present this webinar this afternoon. And Tina too is generously donating her time uh, this afternoon. So everything is at no charge, which is why we've been able to bring it to you for free. But you know the scale of the crisis that children in refugee situations around the world are facing and specifically those in Ukraine at the moment. And we could would encourage any of you if at all possible, and however much you could donate, to consider donating to dec.org.uk and you can find the address in front of you at the moment. How to talk to our children and young people about war, understanding and supporting our refugee children. 
So an opportunity here to, to think about the plight of refugee children, again, from wherever they may be traveling. And I noticed that um, Fiona in the chat already had said she was working with refugee children from South America. Um, we know too that we'll have colleagues working with children from Afghanistan, from Syria, from the Yemen, and many other places. Obviously, Ukraine has highlighted the intensity of the experience for refugees and for refugee children who must be in a state of utter bewilderment at what goes on in their lives at times when they're trying to escape war-torn countries. With the support from the Association of Child and Adolescent Mental Health, this evening's webinar will be translated into other languages and will be made accessible. And Alan will be posting further information about that on the uh, general details following this webinar on the Evidence for Learning website, which he's already given you the links to. I'm delighted to say that um, in a conversation I had recently with uh, my publishers at Routledge, um, I suggested to them in the light of this webinar, they may want to approach Tina about publishing some of her excellent materials. I'm indeed delighted to say that conversation's taken place. Tina informs me she's already written 16,000 words um, and there will be a forthcoming book to follow up this webinar today. And we need to congratulate Tina yet again for her commitment to these causes that are often on the margins of our society. So without further ado, I want to particularly welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Tina Ray. Tina is indomitable. She has a great capacity to write. She has a phenomenal capacity to lecture, but she has an enormous humanity. She is able to go where children need her to go. She brings her expertise and insights to the needs in that moment for that child. And she's so articulate either in the written or spoken word that she enables us to envision with her how we can touch that child at their point of learning need. Many of our refugee children will have become disengaged learners. They will be anxious children in a fight, flight or freeze mode which will not make them the most engaged and engaging of learners. And yet Tina finds techniques and strategies and approaches that enable us to get closer and closer, to reignite that flame of learning once more in that child. This is a group that already, as I've said, some of you are working with, but for others, and I'll include myself in that, this will be a new experience. But I know the very fact you're here in your own time at the end of what I'm sure has been a busy working day, you will want to be there for those children and give them the best of your abilities to make your school communities welcoming places and to guide those children already in our schools who are equally horrified at seeing the plight of other children being torn from their homes and from their countries. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. Tina Ray. Tina, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Barry. That was really kind, very generous. I'm hoping that this session today is going to be informative and helpful at a time when I know that all of us are experiencing heightened levels of stress and anxiety. Um, this is compounded, obviously, that the, the COVID pandemic is ongoing, but now with this war in the Ukraine specifically, I think we're all experiencing heightened levels of stress and anxiety. And I've designed this session specifically to support parents, carers, and those who are school-based practitioners in terms of actually giving us, them a sense of reassurance that they are able to and are um, I think, in my view, able to support children to reduce their anxiety and ensure specifically that our refugee children and young people can safely integrate into their new school communities and contexts. 
So I'm hoping that as a result of this session today, a sincere hope for me is that you will leave here with a range of key tools and strategies which are evidence based, which emanate from psychological perspectives, which we know work from the research that we know really does inform our practice. And also that you can have the confidence in delivering interventions which do not need to be delivered by psychologists, which need to be delivered by people in schools now at the chalk faced on the ground level in a really evidence-based way and a safe way. So I think that's really, really important. This is about inspiring confidence and increasing your awareness of what you can do and what you're already doing well. So building on what I call best trauma-informed practice. So as an educational and child psychologist, I have worked now for um, 40 years in education as a teacher, a psychologist, a therapeutic worker, supporting young people in both educational and clinical contexts. And I've always, as Barry said, been passionate about children's well-being and their mental health. And part of that, um, for me, a, a real sort of imperative here is, is about producing practical user-friendly resources that people can pick up and use on the ground so they don't have to keep recreating, reinventing the wheel, but to do so in a safe and a, an effective way. So a key feature of my work has been around supporting those with depression, anxiety, and of course, during the last couple of years with this ongoing COVID pandemic, this is becoming more necessary than ever, in my view. The increase in mental health difficulties in our children and young people is a well-known fact now. We have the evidence to show this. Um, so from my perspective, I think we know that many of our children have been quite severely affected by the lockdowns. We had the, the news today, this morning, that um, Ofsted have found that our young children have actually regressed significantly and many of them have not developed the language skills that they need in order to begin to access learning in a school context. So I've also had a really passionate belief that we need to be supporting children young people through transition through grief and through loss and this for me has been something that over the years I feel has not been addressed it's only in the last kind of 10 to sort of 15 years that I think people have been really recognizing the important need for this in schools and I would suggest now that this is an absolute imperative for us so I'm hoping that today we'll probably from my perspective, provide you with a range of ideas and tools and strategies that people can take away and use virtually straight away. There should be some golden nuggets here that will help you as you go through the process of supporting children, young people in talking about the war and in actually managing the stress and anxiety around it. And also making sure that our children and young people who are coming into our schools at this current time from traumatic places and experiences that they've encountered will be able to affect transition. One of the ways in which I tend to communicate with people is by producing this kind of resource, which is a plan, so that in a nutshell we have the advice, everything that I'm going to say in this presentation today will probably be summarised in this WE plan. And I've shared this on Twitter a few weeks ago, about three or four weeks ago, and I, I felt very much that it's been really, really helpful to so many people who were feeling incredibly anxious because actually what we need essentially is reassurance that we are and can be doing the right thing. I think that there is something significant that needs to be stated at the outset, however. I, I think that this is the first time ever in our history that we're probably seeing a social media war. We've not had a war that has been presented on social media in quite the same way as this has. It's not only being broadcast 24 hours a day on TV, but it's on social media apps such as Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. So adults and children, young people are viewing violent images on a daily basis. And some of the videos which have been tagged hashtag Ukraine war have been viewed over 600 million times in a matter of days. So clearly what we have to factor into our thinking, our, our interactions now is that this material can be triggering to all of us and have a significant psychological impact. And we know, as Barry said at the outset, the introduction here, the Ukraine war is only one of many recent global conflicts. So we're thinking about unrest in Syria, the, the war in Afghanistan and instability in Iraq, for example, and the worldwide COVID pandemic. These are only a few 
of the items on a long list of traumatic events have impacted on mental health across the globe. And it has more significantly impacted on children and young people than ever before. It has changed their lives in many respects. So I do think at the outset, what is important is that we do talk about it. We do actually engage with our children and young people in an age appropriate way. I've had some parents say to me in the last few weeks, I'm trying to shield my child. So we're not talking about it. We're not actually having these conversations. My worry here is that by doing that, by actually not having those conversations, what we're tending to do then is almost create an elephant in the room here. Think about this logically. A child will get more and more anxious if something is disregarded, if it's pushed to, to one side, if we're not discussing it. And I think it's really important if we communicate effectively, we will reduce the fear of the unknown and the related anxiety. I am very conscious about the fact that we need to accept, validate and affirm their feelings. And that's hugely, hugely important, not dismissing them. So really becoming what Gottman would call an emotion coach, making sure that we recognize that they're feeling anxious, that they're feeling worried. We talk about it, we're curious about it. We're not furious, we don't dismiss it. We don't say, you'll get over it, don't worry about it. Let's not think about it. Because actually that just stores up the trauma in our bodies and it's gonna come out at some point if we if we try and squash it within. So very, very important. I also think as the adults here, if we're talking about such difficult topics, which are so, so triggering, we have to look to ourselves first because without the kind of self-care routines, we can't regulate ourselves. We can't maintain that self-regulation we need in order to interact in that therapeutic way with our children and young people. And we know dysregulated adults cannot possibly support or nurture dysregulated children. Okay, We have to be regulated first and then we co-regulate so that the child can become regulated too. So absolutely essential. Another thing I think that is just clear common sense from my view, it's not psychology, it's common sense, is that we need to really make sure that we fact check. And that again, can reduce anxiety. So, you know, let's think about this. Where did you get that information from? Is it valid? Who put that information out there? Is that really true? Let's find out the source. Let's check that. That's absolutely essential. And one of the trusted channels for young people, obviously, is BBC News Round. Look at also at how they present that. They present the news in a really, really coherent way. They will talk about the war in Ukraine. They will not sugarcoat anything, but they will do it in a very factual way. They will then have an element of a good news story coming in so that there's a sense of balance. And that's what we need to do in our conversations. Otherwise, we will lose a sense of hope. I also think that when we're talking with our children, we need to be very clear to differentiate. There will be some children who are more at risk, some who are refugees themselves. We don't want to re-trigger things for them. And I'm gonna come back to this later on in this presentation today. We need to be grounded. We need to be clear about what we can control and take control of that so that our self-care, our reduction of time on social media is really, really measured out. And we're very clear about that and we stick to those clear rules for ourselves. Building in daily flow activities, so creativity, play. We know that play is hugely therapeutic. We know that creativity can give us that sense of flow, as Martin Seligman says, and that's really essential, not just for us, but for our children too. So again, if we're talking to them about these tricky topics, we also need to be talking to them about how we manage our daily flow plans, how we manage our daily self-care, us and our children and young people. One of the key things that I'm always asked to think about in my head is look for the good ones, look for the helpers, look for the people who are out there doing stuff in times of war and danger, because they're there. These, pe these people are, are the ones that we should be noticing and celebrating because they give us a sense of hope that human nature is not all bad, that, that we can be good, we can be people who are empath empathetic and care for others and make a difference. And that's very, very important because we must shift away from the narrative of good and bad. Some people are really good, some people are really bad. Actually, there are lots of people out there who are doing the best they can to really make a difference and to help 
in a time that's really chaotic and stressful for many. I also think this notion about taking time away sometimes from what is going on is also an essential. So when I say a digital detox, I also think we need to be thinking about those moments of joy and gratitude and the good things that we can all have. And I think that's vitally important for our children too. We need some release from this. So sometimes anchoring back in what was good before, the lovely times that we had can be really, really helpful in helping us to maintain that balance. And again, balance. Balance is, an, is it also about the language that we use with our children too. Alongside making sure that we fact check, the information needs to be presented in a balanced way. So, you know, for example, this may be really scary, but there's still hope. There's still good people in this world. Look for the help of us, they're out there, okay? And there are lots of anxiety reducing easy wins that we can actually make use of, such as structure, routines, exercise, and that quality time together. And again, I'm gonna come back to this in the presentation because they are key also to ensuring this safe transition for our children who are coming in now from the Ukraine. And ultimately, of course, as Bruce Perry said, it's all in the relationships, our relationships with those key adults, those who nurture, provide us with that place of sanctuary, a safe base. These are the people who will ensure that we can engage in post-traumatic growth. And that's an absolute essential. So we've got to be in all our interactions now, the calm and reassuring adult, gaining our energy from those who also show compassion and fearlessness at this current time. And compassion is so, so important, being compassionate to ourselves too. This is difficult and none of us are perfect and none of us are gonna get this all right. And sometimes we will feel overwhelmed as well, but as the adults, we need to try and do our very best to manage that in the best way possible. At the start, our children and young people now in schools who are buddying up and taking in their refugee friends into their classrooms, into their form groups, will have lots of questions, will feel anxious and, and have been voicing concerns about what if I say the wrong thing? Do I ask them about what's gone on in the war? Do I ask them to talk about these experiences? What do I do if they become aggressive or violent or if they display trauma related behaviors? I don't understand this. How do I understand this? I think there's a need to make sure that our children have a real understanding of trauma, how it manifests itself, have a real understanding about the do's and don'ts of supporting their peers as they come in, how to respond, what not to say, and how to be with them. Because actually, I'm gonna say this again and again today, school is the best medicine. We know this from the research and being with peers who engage with you, support you, welcome you, nurture you, play with you, and try to teach you their language, et cetera, et cetera, is hugely powerful. And this is what we need to be giving our children, this kind of message that they can do so much. I also think we need to be careful once we do have our children integrated in, that we are very specific about when we do and don't talk about this in terms of whole class or whole, whole form group sessions. We've got to be very, very sensitive because there clearly will be a risk of PTSD or re-traumatizing some of our refugee children. So think very carefully about introducing this topic of war in terms of that whole session, in terms of the, all the children being together. What is important, I think, to be saying to our school-based staff and parents and carers at this time is that normal routines will heal most. Hold on to that fact. I'm going to come back to that. And it's so important. We mustn't forget to have fun. Keep the joy and the hope of it all. And also in schools at the moment, let's be the helpers. I know so many wonderful children, and young people who are doing fantastic things in terms of fundraising. They've been writing to their MPs. They've been working in the community to, to put the resources together. They've been doing some absolutely amazing things. Let's really build on that. We do need to define what a refugee is for our children and young people. We need to be very clear about that too. We need to be very, very open and honest about the fact that these are children coming in who have been persecuted. And I think this definition from the Red Cross is very clear, very straightforward. You may want to adapt it for a child or young person in terms of their age 
obviously all cognitive ability that's not an issue that's not a problem starting schools are really really good at doing this what's really important is that these children and their parents at the moment cannot return to their home country it's a war they need to be here they need to be kept safe at this moment in time however we know from the world health organization that approximately 10 percent of those who experience a traumatic event will subsequently develop a serious mental health problem. And a further 10% will also develop behaviour which prevents them from functioning effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. The most common effects are depression, anxiety, psychosomatic problems such as insomnia. So lots of our refugee children are going to need some help, particularly around those particular issues. Um, and sleep issues are going to be quite dominant, I think. Um, from my perspective, it's important that we know what trauma is and we know how it manifests itself. A psychologically distressing event that is outside the range of human experience, often involving a sense of intense fear, terror and helplessness. This is from Perry. It happens when any experience stuns us like a bolt out of the blue. It overwhelms, it leaves us altered and disconnected from our bodies and any coping mechanisms we may have had or have are undermined and we feel totally helpless and hopeless. Um, Levine says it's almost as if our legs are knocked from under us. This is going to be the experience of many of our refugee children coming in. So we need to be clear about looking out and, and engaging what I call watchful waiting for some of these symptoms and signs, because PTSD we know can affect children as well as adults. And some of our children will lose interest in activities they used to enjoy. They'll have these physical symptoms, headaches, stomach aches, sleep disruption. And sometimes this will manifest itself in some difficult, more aggressive behaviours. Sometimes they will go to hyperarousal, sometimes hypoarousal, when they retreat and withdraw. And I think some of our children will reenact some of these traumatic events in their play. And I think this is important. Watch for waiting, look for the signs and symptoms. But what we also know very clearly is that every child reacts to trauma differently and the reaction will depend on their developmental level, their previous life experiences, the level of exposure to the trauma. So some of our children who are only recently coming in will have been exposed to a great deal more to some extent in many instances. Parental reactions, how their parents cope, how they respond, how they are able to remain or not remain regulated and obviously subsequent changes in living um, living situations will also have an impact on how they respond. However, as the Centre of National Research on Disability and Rehabilitation Medicine states, the majority of children are resilient. Back to that into your thinking, I'm going to come back to it. But we need to look for these behaviours and vulnerability factors. Being more clingy, wanting more hugs or physical contact, separation anxiety, not being wanting to be away from the parent, too frightened to be away, more withdrawn, not sleeping, eating properly, again, anger, irritability, tense or fidgety, those psychosomatic symptoms, maybe hypervigilance, aggression and separation anxiety. For me, in a nutshell, this will be the descriptors of many in our refugee communities coming in. But I think it's really important to remember this. Please don't panic. And this is a key message for me, for me, from um, in terms of school based practitioners out there who might be feeling very, very nervous. I've heard people say we, we're just kind of overwhelmed. We're not therapists. We don't know how we're going to cope with this. You don't need to be therapists. OK, it's really, really important to remember what the research tells us. Many refugee children are resilient. They cope well with adversity and they do well in school. And the majority of refugees will cope well with the terrible events to which they've been exposed and the very difficult circumstances which they and their families have had to live. That can seem very, very difficult for us as adults who have been bombarded in the last few weeks with these awful images, potentially some indicating genocide. We, we can't kind of get our heads around that, but it's really important to factor that into our thinking because this is evidence from the research. In the first instance, what we need to be are schools of sanctuary where we are committed to being a safe, 
and welcoming place for these children and their families who are seeking sanctuary. This is so, so important. What does that mean? We extend this welcome to them all, every one of them, if they speak Russian, if they speak Ukrainian, if they speak any other language, if they come from any community where they have felt persecuted, frightened, been abused, suffered trauma, okay? They need to be welcomed in as equal valued members of our school community. And a school of sanctuary is in essence, one that is proud to be a place of safety and inclusion for all. In 2014, the National Union, then National Union of Teachers, produced a wonderful document um, where it was emphasising the six main areas of support that refugee children and young people would need coming in to our school communities. And I just want to go through these and give you some ideas here, because I think that these are and still remain hugely pertinent today. It was a very, very helpful piece of work. Asking for help and support, absolutely essential. If you're nervous, if you're worried, if you're thinking about I'm doing the wrong thing, we have psychology services. I know that CAMS is hugely stressed, under resourced at the current time. You have educational and child psychologists out there in your services who um, I really do think are there and able to offer some really useful practical advice at this current time and provide many of them some therapeutic insights and support for you in school in terms of providing the right kind of interventions for these children. I also think at the outset for parents coming in with their children, these refugee families, what do they need? Practical help, practical support. You know, those children need pencil cases. They need the resources to come into school so that they can access the curriculum. They need to have the uniforms. They need to have the PE kits, the stuff that you kind of, we take for granted. We need to stop and think about what that kind of support would look like on a purely practical basis. There needs to be networks for these parents to actually gain support from each other. Now, from my perspective, when we're thinking about this and we're thinking about induction, what is absolutely crucial is language acquisition. This is the main challenge. It's the main barrier between home and school, the child and his peer group, the parents and school, the teachers and parents, etc. So very, very stressful. Think about the level of stress that that has for children and young people coming in when they can't communicate so effectively. So it's absolutely essential at the outset that we provide language support. And as someone who in the 80s worked for the Inner London Education Authority and I was part of the English as a second language team, I am passionate about this. It creates such a barrier. So we need to make sure that these children have access to that kind of support. And I would also say that our schools need to be working together now to pull their resources and think about, you, you, you can have a designated bilingual family liaison officer. I think this is an essential. If you're part of a multi-academy trust or you're part of a, a huger group, a, a big group of schools, then surely this is the time when you should be thinking about ensuring that that role is there and is being used effectively. I also think utilising the skills of the other children. You will have children who speak other languages. You will have children who are very good peer support you, um, to others, who are good at teaching others how to do new things, who've been modelling social behaviours, who've been part of a Circle of Friends initiative, for example, who are able to go out and teach other children to play, teach them games, who can socialise really, really well and be supportive and nurturing. Let's make use of those skills now. And creating this climate in which they feel welcome and valued is not quite as difficult as I think people think. We are empathic. We are loving human beings. We are the kind of people who work in education, who are there, not because of the money, not because of financial gain. We're there because we're committed to the well-being and development of our children and young people. And creating that climate is all about creating the compassionate, nurturing environment. And I know that many of our schools are doing a fantastic job at that already. And I think, you know, there are simple practical things that we can do, like ensuring that the labelling is right, that we actually have Ukrainian language signs everywhere around the school. This is the library. This is the dining hall. This is where the head teacher lives. Let's make sure that that is really in place. It's not a difficult thing to do. Again, with the curriculum, making it accessible. I am convinced that we can bring in, for example, some of our parents, refugee parents who do have 
English and they're re relatively fluent in it to help the child to access the curriculum and organize the classroom so that our children can do that. And when we're thinking about that additional support, don't forget, I talk about using educational psychologists. There are a huge number of wonderful therapists out there, many of whom I know from personal experience are willing and able to donate their time. A lot of it is being done pro bono at the moment, which is absolutely fabulous. Lots of these children, but not all of them, because this is on a continuum, may need some kind of therapeutic input at some point. So, you know, we've got access to CBT, trauma, trauma system therapy interventions, including the Tree of Life narrative therapy and other creative approaches, which really harness the beneficial effects of music, art and play. And that's absolutely vital. So let's look for that. Let's let's find those resources. This is the kind of help and support we need to be asking for now at this current time. But another positive, please look at what you're doing already in your schools, because there is so much that we're doing now at this current time. There's been huge initiatives in the past few years in terms of mental health awareness, the development of the role of our mental health leads in schools, a lot more in terms of our knowledge of and ability to deliver on trauma-informed classrooms. We know a lot more about how to support children with grief, loss and bereavement. And my goodness, again, this is something that we're going to have to build upon now. We know about critical incidents. Many of you will have lost people in your school. You would have engaged with your educational psychology service to put in place critical incident plans, etc. You'll also have emotionally available adults who can co-regulate with children already in the school. You will have your ELSAs, your emotionally literate support assistants. You'll have many of your TAs who've been trained up to actually sit to work more therapeutically with children and young people. There will be a greater understanding of how to ensure a sense of belonging, how to manage anxiety. Many of you will have created calm corners and safe spaces and you'll recognize the power of these compassionate relationships. So I think this whole thing, share our knowledge and experience is really, really important. We know we're on the way to building more resilient and safe communities. We've been doing this for many, many years. So remember that we can do this and we can do this together. And it's an ongoing project of recovery in my view. So again, I developed this refugee support plan to just really, in a nutshell, put it into one page to make it accessible so that you can actually take this away and give it to parents, give it to others who may need it. Just as a, a kind of pointer, these, this in an essence summarizes the key points that I'm making this afternoon. We know that our children will be experiencing heightened levels of stress, anxiety, our, our refugee children, some of them will be really traumatized and we need to be empathetic. We need to ensure that they are welcomed and included, that we are a school of sanctuary. But we also need to be very clear about this. We mustn't assume that everyone will be traumatized. This is not the case. All the research demonstrates that refugee children display resilience, resourcefulness and high functioning despite the adversities encountered. Again, it might be hard for us to believe this at this current time, but it is a fact. So very, very, very important. What we do need to do, however, is be vigilant. Some of this trauma will not be presented straight away. Some of these children at the top end of the continuum who will need a bespoke intervention, they will not show this for some time. So we need to engage in what I said was watchful waiting. But we've also got to listen to the voice of the child. So, so important. We need to ensure that they feel valued, that we're listening to them, that they're safe, they feel loved in our school communities and provide that practical support they and their families need at the outset. I talked about the signs and systems that we should set up and also about the respite from anxiety that many of us will need. Now, look, I worked in um, a London school in Shepherd's Bush for many, many years when I was in my 20s. I was 21 when I started working there. And we had lots of refugees in from Somalia and other places. And I remember one little boy, I'm not going to give you his name, who came in. And I remember very much about 
feeling so, so anxious. And I said to my wonderful head teacher at the time, I'm really worried about this. I've got no experience of this. I don't know what to do. This, this child doesn't speak any English. Um, it, he's never been to school as far as I can see. How am I gonna manage this? It was, it was absolutely frightening. So I get, and I do understand people's trepidation and anxiety around this. However, I have to say that from my perspective, once this child had come into school, and once he was beginning to integrate, once he was allowed to play, once he was allowed to learn the language, it became very obvious to me that this child really needed a respite from anxiety. And what he didn't want, and he said this to me about a year and a half into our relationships, I taught him in year five and six, he said, do you know what? I didn't want to be called refugee. I wanted to be called by my name. And also, I wish that you'd ask me about my favourite football team. I'm going to come back to this rather than the journey that I made to the UK. Um, his face lit up when I asked him about his football team. And actually, I'm so grateful to my head teacher then, Frank Hamner, who said, ask him that question. Ask him about his football team. Accessible curriculum, promoting play, socialisation, physical activity, flow activities, absolutely essential. That activity scheduling and also observing their existing skill set. I think this is really, really important. Find out about them. What do they do? What, do they, what are they interested in? What are they passionate about? What do they feel they were good at? And also remember, allow time for further development because there may have been some regression due to that trauma. There may be some impact on working memory, on processing um, abilities. So we've got to kind of reflect on that, but respect their need to fit in and remember the key, in my view, is school itself. Simply being in school is the best medicine because we provide that safety, security and routine which enables that post-traumatic growth. So schools as a safe base to start with. OK, and when Mitchell says practical help and advice may be a helpful starting point, of course it is. It makes sense. This is common sense. I say it again. It's not psychology. And we can nurture resilience, okay? Very, very, very important. These are the key factors that have been identified as promoting the resilience of our refugee children. The need to feel loved, to be supported by that key adult or mentor, that therapeutic adult who can listen, who can help me to co-regulate, who can hear my unstored fears and anxieties and trauma, who can help me process that to make a coherent narrative. They need to feel empowered. So we've got to teach them the host language, very, very important, so that they develop the social networks they need, feeling engaged so that we're aware of their needs, particularly their special educational needs. We make sure that psychoeducation is available to the families and the school staff, understanding trauma, normalizing responses, reducing stigma and ensuring access to appropriate support, engagement. To feel connected, so using those group processes in class to facilitate that development of those friendships, those relationships, and to cope, absolutely essential. Those programs that we use now to develop self-esteem, social skills, locus of control, those therapeutic approaches that we may be making use of, those creative ones, particularly in music and art, think of the tree of life, for example, absolutely important, but also making local information available because that alleviates this stress of relocation for the family and the child. What's out there for mum? What's out there for the child? And I think this taking on this role of the emotionally available adult, lots of people get nervous about this and they think I'm talking about being a therapist. I'm not. I think it's really, really important. That level of feeling of safety that a child can experience where they can process the difficulties that they have been experiencing. It's really, really important being that person who can, you can talk about those bad memories because that helps the child to process them so that they become in time less overpowering and less stressful. And this is about truly listening, not being judgmental, being the regulated adult, providing that safe space. And people will say to me, oh, but I need to be you know, trained to do that. Well, yes, it really does help. But at this moment in time, I actually think we have to take on this role. I think there's no two ways about it. And of course, those children that we're really worried about, that we know we feel out of our depth, 
we, we refer them on. That's an absolute essential. And that's what those psychologists are out there for. So really, really, really important. In the meantime, though, expressive writing approaches, journaling, children can be encouraged, those that can, to write, to draw, to be creative about their experiences. Now, I'm making reference to the Children and War Foundation um, resources here, and I have to say that they are the best thing that I've come across in the last four weeks when I've been researching this whole topic in some depth. Now, the Children and War Foundation promotes and supports research on the short and long term effects and consequences of war, warlike situations and disasters on children and their families. And this resource in particular is really, really wonderful. Writing feelings about an emotional experience can help reduce distressing reactions and improve health. Think about the evidence base that's out there for journaling, for gratitude journaling in, in, in particular. So, so important, but also, you know, writing it down helps us to unpick some of those knots that we get ourselves into. So very, very important. Have a look at those resources, the Children and War Foundation. Physical approaches, again, this works as a temporary distraction very often, but it produces those endorphins, those chemicals necessary for us to feel better, to feel more balanced, but also to help us resolve some of those difficult situations. So being outside in nature, playing together. And also, of course, calming approaches again can help children and young people overcome the body's fight flight or freeze response we know this so there's an awful lot that we're doing already you'll know about breathing exercises you'll know about mindfulness visualization using tools from cognitive behavior therapy approaches to challenge some of our negative automatic thinking feeling and behaving cycles and particularly recognizing that what we are thinking is not always a fact it's not always true I think this is really, really important. We want to try and develop that toolbox of well-being for each individual child. But I would just factor in a, a wee caveat here. I do think you have to be careful with mindfulness, particularly in group contexts. Some of these children who've experienced trauma would certainly not want to participate to shut their eyes because they are hypervigilant. They want to see what's going on. And sometimes I know from personal experience that mindfulness practice can uh, be re-triggering for some and, and re-trigger re sort of elements of PTSD. So be very, very careful and attuned to that. Creating these calm corners and safe spaces, again, sometimes we will need to get back into our window of tolerance. So we'll need to be able to go somewhere where we can just calm, where we can make use of those tools and strategies to become less hypo or less hyper aroused and get back into that zone that we need to be to manage effectively. And many of our children already are making use of such spaces. And I really would suggest that we think about this really creatively with some of our refugee children coming in. Some of them will have experienced a huge amount of grief and loss and will need to take time just to get some sense of relief, but also to process some of that. Again, there is a wonderful grief manual on the Children and War Foundation, which you can download for free, obviously translated into other language too. There are anxiety reducing easy wins that we can all make use of. I said this at the outset, the structure and routine makes a difference. Being back in the routine of school, of learning, of doing the same things, those routines, going to bed, nighttime, the nighttime story, etc. Exercise, play and free time, again, hugely important. Quality time together where we are off social media, where we're doing lovely things, where we are actually watching something fun on the TV, for example, and limiting that access to the news, having that digital detox is going to be essential for all of us. I also think reflecting and focusing on positives is essential too. So when we talk about that toolbox for our children, we need to think about positive psychology tools, for example. So thinking about those three good things, ha having that happy memory box or book that the children can make up for themselves. So thinking about all the lovely things in my life, the, the lovely memories that I've got, because that gives us a sense of hope. We can anchor back into those when we're feeling stressed and we can't sleep at night, but we can also remember these things can happen again. OK, and ultimately maintaining and building relationships, those compassionate, nurturing relationships, they heal. Notice I'm using the word compassionate a lot today. We cannot underestimate the power of it. 
a wonderful psychologist who I follow on Twitter, Dr. Chris Moore, I have an inordinate amount of respect for, talks about creating the trauma-informed classroom, creating a safe base. Please follow him and also look at his blogs because he has a wonderful blog on this particular topic. And he talks about creating a sense of belonging, predictability, having the organization right, teaching children to self-regulate and regulate, co-regulating with them, differentiating in the right way and building relationships, six keys. So please make reference to that. And please also make reference to my, um, my YouTube channel again, because I have a session on this and also I have a session on creating calm corners and safe spaces. Again, it's all free, freely available to you. So please have a look because there's an awful lot out there that you can access relatively quickly without any cost to support you in this whole process. So what do I do? What does this really look like, trauma-informed support for our children? We create safety. Okay, so again, this quiet corner, the safe space, not so difficult to create a peace place, a safe haven. Sometimes in some of the younger um, classrooms, key stage one reception, I've seen a little Ikea tent that someone's created, but it's, it's possible to do this. The regulation of the nervous system is really, really important. We want to make sure that our children can get back right into the right states so that they can access learning so that they can manage themselves effectively okay and I think that's so so important let's teach our children about this all of them will benefit from this at this current time and they'll all benefit from learning those particular specific strategies for regulating themselves the connected relationships are key we know that positive nurturing relationships, compassionate relationships are the best way ever to regulate the nervous system. Now, that, again, it's not rocket science. We can all do this. I know when I'm around people who make me feel safe, who love me, who are kind to me, who nurture me, who want me to be with them, that, that really does produce the oxytocin I need, okay? So that I can keep calm and manage the stress that I'm bound to experience on a daily basis. Supporting that development of a coherent narrative, as I said earlier, is also important. There is a wonderful app on the Children and War Foundation for refugee parents. You can download it to your phone or you can actually just print off the PDF and it is translated into many languages. And again, this is really, really important. I talked about being the emotionally available therapeutic adult. Refugee parents have to do this. They will be talking to their children about their experiences. So, so important to do that, not to push it down. Really, really important. And again, this gives wonderful advice on talking about those bad, horrible memories so that the child can organize them and be they become less overpowering and stressful over time. Practicing power with strategies is another key strategy that we can all make use of. One of the key hallmarks of trauma is this loss of power, this loss of control. So we need to be modeling power with relationships with our children now. Building those social, emotional and resiliency skills, again, so, so important. Trauma robs us of time developing these skills. It totally does. So very, very important that we provide the opportunities within the curriculum, within the school day for our children to do this. And ultimately fostering what I call post traumatic growth, an absolute essential. These are the qualities and skills that allow us, all of us, adults and children alike, to overcome even the most devastating trauma and not just survive, but find new purpose and meaning in our lives. So problem solving, planning, maintaining focus despite an element of discomfort, self-control, seeking support. We all know that those are key to post-traumatic growth. And I think these are the skills all our refugee children and young people can develop at different times with different levels of intervention. But most of them, okay, I would suggest from the research, most of them will be able to do this. The key in my view is always to listen to the voice of the child, what I did not want, okay? So I'm thinking about the child that I worked with amongst, one amongst many over the time. So what did I not want? There was a wonderful blog published by John McMullen and wonderful Dan O'Hare entitled Talking to Children and Young People About War in the Ukraine. And I thought 
it was so powerful. It was so well informed because obviously based on the research undertaken in Northern Ireland with Syrian refugees, what worked and what didn't work for them in terms of their experiences. And I think it was really, really important. What their research showed was that most of these children and young people just wanted to blend in. They didn't want to be seen as any different. And one of the quotes that I, I have taken directly from the research here is around this notion of making this poster about refugees. In my last year, the teacher asked me to go into their classroom and talk more about Syria and the refugees and things. I found it quite hard to talk at the back old harmful memories. And like, actually, I don't want to talk about it. Now that's not because that child has unresolved trauma or wants to repress it. He's talked through it, he's had support. That's because actually he wants to be the same. He's a human being, he's a child, he's a young person in a school who wants to be treated as such. I also think there is something else that they raised which I thought was really, really pertinent and I've touched on already in this session. When we are discussing this with our children, young people, when we're talking about war with our existing cohorts and with those coming in, this is really, really important. It's very, very easy to draw on notions of good, and bad sides, the good is and the bad is. And I think sometimes these ideas can sadly be generalized to everyday life. And we have to be very, very careful, very vigilant at this time, because I think some of our children are feeling very, very vulnerable at this time. One mother, Russian speaking mother that I spoke to said she did not give her child food to take in from their culture on World Food Day that they had a world food celebration in their school. She said it was the first time she'd never done it because she was worried about some backlash. So I think it's really important. There are going to be children from Estonia, Latvary, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Moldova, Georgia, etc. Um, and I think we have to be very vigilant about that. So my quote, his face lit up when I asked him about which football team he supported, not when he was asked to tell the class about his journey to the UK. I think this sense of normality matters so much. I think it's absolutely vital. So ultimately, a key message really, I suppose, is that we need to be the helper now. And we can all do this. There is so much we're doing already. And just remember this, when we get frightened, when we feel the overwhelm, the sense of overwhelm, when we think these children are gonna be so traumatized, remember, that is not the case, not always, okay? Very, very important, the research evidence is there to show us that. And it also, the research evidence, EPS 2018, shows us school really is the best medicine. So look for that message and, and share that message. So let's think what we're doing now. We can provide that sense of safety, safe base. We know how to use effective peer support, translation services, family advice, expertise, we've got those systems in place in many of our schools. Being in school is the best medicine. If we understand how to respond in a trauma-informed way and create that culture and those contexts, those classrooms, that will be wonderful for these children coming in. That's exactly what they need. They need those emotionally available adults who can regulate and co-regulate. They need to be listened to. They will tell us what they need. Just like children after the COVID pandemic in the lockdowns came back, they told us what they needed. Most of them didn't need catch up academically. They needed catch up emotionally. They needed to play with their friends. So very, very important, listen to the voice of the child and young person and create a team approach. Let's be vigilant, watchful waiting, observing, reflecting, exchanging observations by quick network meetings. Let's keep in mind those with greater vulnerabilities. But if we feel unsure, ask and refer. Phone up your psychology service, ask for a consultation over the phone, discuss it, have that, use the consultation process as it was meant to be used when it was first created. So again, in a nutshell, the refugee support plan, please, share it, please download it, make use of it, and really do hope it's been helpful. And thank you very, very much for listening to me for the last I think, 55 minutes or so, once I turned on my volume. Um, and I will take you back now to Barry, and hopefully um, he will be able to field the questions as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. That was just so rich. It was a real treasure trove of, of ideas and the way that you articulated those ideas, it, it made it all so tangible and, and viable. And you, it's possible to see as, as you're speaking, how some of those things can come to be. 
in, in the classroom. You've given hooks almost for anybody listening to this presentation. It's a really impressive, diverse range of people this afternoon from all parts of the United Kingdom, which is absolutely fabulous. It just shows the reach that, that your work is having, Tina, and how much people want to, to listen to you. Um, you did use the phrase, support is the best medicine, many, many times. But I loved the way that at the heart of that saying, you always emphasise that school is a place of hope and of nurture, as well as of learning. And um, I wondered if, if by way of um, starting the discussion and, and then we'll move on to some of the questions that are coming in too, you obviously talked about resilience. Um, the theme of resilience, and you and I have shared much during the pandemic period as well, uh, and with the work around recovery curriculum, um, our children have gone from pandemic to talk now of war, neither of which are really exciting topics for children. I'm not sure they are for adults. And I know that one of your things, Tina, is about self-care. And I'm thinking for our teachers and our workers in schools and, and those in our psychology and health services, um, their resilience is going to be enormous. I mean, it's, it's just key. And we're asking them to dig deep and pull on their inner strength yet again to help another group of children who have been through trauma. I, I wonder if you've got any ideas around self-care, how teachers and other workers should look after themselves. I do. I do, actually. But I, I'm really quite passionate about self-care, which very often people think of as a cheesy option. You know, it's kind of quite hackneyed um, in many respects because people think about it as kind of, you know, doing some stones or deep breathing or meditation. And, and it kind of, it can sound airy-fairy. And I'm very um, practical, as, as is clearly obvious. And I'm very passionate about the fact you need to do what works for you. And if that means walking, if that means walking your dog every day, if that means taking time out just to sit in the garden and have a cup of tea, that is self-care as well. What I don't like is when, um, and I found quite distressing sometimes when I've talked to teachers and they said, well, the school have tried to look after us all. They're doing wonderful things about kind of creating these spaces so that on Tuesday we can all do yoga or we can all do mindfulness on Friday afternoon at 3.30. Actually, when I talk to teachers, what they say to me is self-care for me begins with the head teacher recognising how we need to streamline the assessment process, how we need to streamline our marking policy, how we need to say to people, do you know what? At quarter to four, you're out the door on a Friday because you've got a weekend ahead of you where you need to be with your, your kids, you need to spend time relaxing and you don't need to worry about this. Self-care, from my perspective, is putting clear boundaries around what you do and don't do. So if someone sends, for example, an email to me at 10 to 10 at night and says, read this document for tomorrow morning's team meeting, I delete it, which probably sounds naughty. I can always go back and look if I need to, but I delete it because I'm angry because actually for me, that's about boundaries and keeping yourself well means you need to put those in place. When we didn't have the internet, people weren't bombarded in the same way. So if you wanted someone to read a document ahead of a meeting, you would send it out the week before and someone would read it because they would timetable that into their diary. So self-care is also around those practical things. And actually the message has to come from the top. It has to come from senior, senior leaders in school who were saying, do you know what, actually, I'm not gonna do this to my stuff. I'm not gonna email anybody after 6 p.m. in the evening because actually they should have stopped by then. They need to have that breathing space. Alongside that, I do think there's an awful lot we can do in terms of positive psychology tools and resources. I do engage personally in creative stuff, singing, music. I listen to lots and lots of music. That's really therapeutic. I actually do engage in what I call flow activities on a daily basis. I do reflect on three positives at the end of each day. I plan acts of kindness every morning when I get up because that actually helps me to focus on not me all the time. Um, so I do actually live and breathe positive psychology. It's not just something that I, I talk about. It works for me. But I think it's about finding what works for you and putting that in your toolbox. It's not going to be the same for everybody. So I do think it's really, really, really important. Um, Self-care is vital. At the moment, 
I have never seen so many stressed adults. I've never seen so many stressed teachers. I have never known so many people who contracted COVID than in the last two weeks. I had a weekend away cancelled last weekend because my sister-in-law and her daughter have got COVID. It's, it's really, it's not gone away. So this is so, so important. Yeah, I mean, there are lot, there's lots out there around self-care. I want to then link to a question that's coming to the Q&A, Tina, and um, goes back to my opening comments just about um, your phrase about school is the best medicine. And, and Daniela says to us, I've heard of plans in some local authorities of initially keeping refugees together. Yet, as you say, school is the best environment for them. What do you think about those plans? <laughs> well, I think it's a tricky one, this, because I actually think those children should be in school. In my view, school is the best, best medicine. I think that they may need to be together in school in order to support each other. And I think they may need to be together in school in groups to learn English, some of them. Mm. So I can understand that element but actually no I don't see that as being helpful or healthy if we're talking about having them out there somewhere in an alternative provision um, I'm not sure how well that would work and I, I, I do think these children have been in school up until about a month and a half ago so actually they need to get back in as quickly as possible otherwise the gap is going to get bigger and bigger and you know they've shown us the research has shown us they want to be treated like everybody else they want to be a kid in a school. They don't want to be someone who's a refugee child out there. I think that's hugely important because you've got to think about what that does to their self-esteem, what it does in terms of affecting their narrative and making sense of what's happening to them. I think I would be um, really very, very worried about that kind of setup if that's what it is going to look like. Yeah, okay. I've got a really, really interesting question from Sasha. Um, I'm going to read it because the way she's written it is, is wonderful. Firstly, thank you for the webinar and your support for Ukraine. I am Ukrainian, living here in the UK. I help British hosts to get matched with Ukrainian families. I've spoken to a Ukrainian mother with a 14-year-old boy who have managed to flee Kharkiv and to a safer part of, of the Ukraine. The boy has become very withdrawn and refuses to continue on their journey to flee Ukraine. The mother is really hoping to find safety in the UK. How could you recommend she engage the boy in discussion and persuade him to come to the UK? Gosh, that's some question. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I just, what a phenomenal task for that mother. And I, I think when you're talking about the age of that boy, this, this is the real issue for me. I'm so aware that some of the children who have already come in and they're teenagers, um, because of their access to social media, because they're online all the time, they're not getting the same kind of respite unless they're in school. Because what they're still doing is that they're on their mobile phones all the time, still looking at images of what's going on, worried about people who are still there, worried about colleagues who are still there, friends who are still there, fam family members who are still there. And I think this is so, so tricky, so difficult, because actually it's about the power of that and how you use it. And maybe I think so somehow linking into what's going on on social media and talking about what is happening here and how this is being effective for some of these children, young people, maybe, you know, some, can you, can you do a video call where actually what you're doing is you're talking to this boy, you know, and his mother about what it's gonna be like if he does come here, how safe people feel, what, what the experiences of children, who, young people of his age have already come here. Maybe that could be, a routine. I don't think it's an easy thing to answer at all. No, no it's, it's not. Incredible. But difficult. it's just interesting to hear that perspective and that situation, isn't it? And yes, yeah. That reminds us of the journey that the children will have gone on to get to this country or any other country for that matter. I want to combine, there's a, a, two questions that have come in, one from Teresa and one from Caroline. Teresa makes reference, Tina, to those beautiful posters that you have had produced and have put yeah. out and I know we're going to make those available in the resources from this um, webinar. Yes. Um, um, Teresa is asking if the, there is generally a template based on those posters that could be used for welcoming refugees from other countries, that was her question. Um, but to combine that with Caroline's question, um, she's asking about what she could do to prepare 
her school, her classroom, because they're having a child from Ukraine join the school after the Easter break. And I was obviously going to say, well, have you seen Tina's beautiful poster set? Um, do I explain that they shouldn't ask questions about the war? Um, she really likes the way you've, you've said that refugee children want to be asked the same questions as others, i.e. your football um, uh, uh, example. I plan to focus on the first few days on settling her in well-being, play, finding out her likes, dislikes. Um, how soon after do you suggest I start with the academic work? And, and I was pleased, Tina, when you raised curriculum accessibility, because let's face it, coming into blended phonics is not the starting point, is it? For a no. child who speaks English, and I hope Ofsted are going to make their accommodations too, if I can say that dirty word. But she just welcome any ideas you've got. Yeah, how old is the child? She doesn't say specifically. Um, Caroline, if you're still around, can you just jot that in about how old the child is? But um, but your posters, Tina, are going to be in the resources? The, the posters are in the resources. They're downloadable. Um, someone queried me on, you know, why it looked so Ukrainian and just Ukraine colours. And I said, well, she said, surely, you know, did you, you, you're telling me you didn't mean to do that. Um, and I thought, well, actually, I did because that was my focus in making these specific resources at this time. I want to make that very, very clear. It was not an error of judgment or a mistake. I did that on purpose. I think, I'm sure that if I talk to Stephen from Aardvark, it could be possible to actually get these into various different colors. So, so it was representative of other refugee communities. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, I mean, obviously he's been wonderful because he's provided again, all of his time, all of his services for free, which has just been absolutely terrific. I'm so delighted. And, and this is someone who designs all the stuff for um, Nurture UK. I just wanted to flag that up because I, I needed to give him a shout out there. Yeah, sure. um, Caroline says the child is, um, is going to be year five, 10 years old. Year five, okay. I mean, I, I, I'm glad that you're thinking about not asking questions straight away. I, I think that this child will need to be nurtured in. I think that, you know, basically this notion of starting with academic work, I think they'll let you know. And I think you should be starting with the creative stuff, the drawing, the things that they can express without actually having to use the English language, if that is going to be the issue for them. And the support that you put in are buddies. You know, I'd get some lovely buddies in there to actually help them. And again, not asking them questions about their experiences, but asking them, would you like to play? Do you want to learn the games that we play in our playground? Do you want to come and do some art with me, some painting with me? Do you want, and, and lots of lovely creative things. And, you know, maybe that timetable will be slightly different for a wee bit, but actually I think it's all about that consistency, the routines, the balance for that child, that young person. So really, really important. Don't start with the academic until that child actually is signaling that that's what they want to be doing more. So, so important, you know, and I think one of the things I'd want to do is find out what this child really loves doing, what they're interested in, what are the games that they play, whether they can share some of their games as well. So give them a sense of autonomy. So it's not just about being done unto by the other children who are welcoming, which is wonderful, but it's also about finding out more about the child too. I think that would be absolutely essential. And I think you're going down the right room route. And Alistair um, says that the uh, popular sports in Ukraine are football, basketball, hockey and tennis. So maybe some activities around those uh, sports where they might have had some experience. Excellent. Yeah. We've got an interesting question from Mary Laws, who says that she lives in a small village of 85 houses and we have six Ukrainian families hosting here. What could you suggest we could do with the families together in our village hall? Oh, do you know, I think cooking. I'm, so, I'm always one for food. I think share the food, share the experiences, share the, share the recipes, celebrate that culture in a way that is really inclusive and is nothing to do with the horrible stuff, horrors. It's about actually being together and celebrating bits of their culture, music, food, etc. I think that would be absolutely wonderful. You know, um, and also, again, sharing their skill set, sharing their knowledge, because I think sometimes it's, it's about empowering the adults in the community to recognize how they can contribute, not only to their child's education, but to their child being assimilated in. 
that makes sense. But oh, I'd I'd, I'd have um, cooking. I'd have cooking. And then Noel has, has just expanded your point there. Noel tells us that um, they've initially held weekly Syrian coffee mornings, followed by um, those for the Afghani community, and they're certainly extending it to uh, the Ukraine uh, and shared play activities for yeah. children. Yeah. And I did wonder when you're talking about those activities, I wonder initially, Tina, when the refugee children will not have much spoken English, if any at all, whether we should pre-prepare some photographs supported perhaps by some symbols so you can put an array of activities out and they can just see graphically visually what the activities are and point to the ones that they want rather than get the embarrassment of not being able to reply in English we need yeah. to use that that spoken bit until they get more confident and have yeah. heard enough English to be confident to, to speak it so I would just recommend preparing some photographs some symbols using yeah. cue and clue yeah, absolutely. And just think about what you would do with kids on the continuum. Yeah. And pets and stuff. It's, it's, it's not, we're doing it already so, so much. The other thing I'm thinking about as well for refugee parents, if you're thinking about, you, you hosted six families, I do think that there is a need for psychoeducation to share with them. And this could be a role for your, your school psychologist again. Really, really important. Um, I think that, you know, sharing what trauma looks like the experiences what people will actually may potentially develop as risk factors in the future but also really giving them support to manage things like sleep problems to manage their own anxiety to have a safe space to talk about that together so that they provide a support network with the help of the school psychologist or the mental health lead can be really really powerful because i, I talked about that app for refugee parents from the Children and War Foundation. And I have to say, it is so beautifully written. It is so accessible. And if I as a, was a parent reading that, I would feel so hugely reassured. But why it's important as well is because if people are trying to do things in school that are trauma informed, that really needs to be kind of mirrored in what's going on at home and parents need to understand that and also not feel any kind of stigma around that too, if that makes sense. So I would check that out. Yeah. Um, Alistair tells us Oak National Academy are translating resources into Ukrainian and Russian. Yes, both mainstream and specialist resources. Uh, and Joe Moore reminds us that play is a universal language and you've already referred yes. to play. Um, and several people saying how incredibly pain, uh, powerful uh, that, that example of food is in the sharing of food. Uh, and Susan Kavanagh said, if you do get Ukrainian young people, certainly get them to show you how to make dumplings out of potato because they're just incredible. Yeah, marvellous. So um, uh, one more question that's, that's come up here um, is... Uh, from Sarah Coles about what's your view on the importance of children maintaining their first language and of using these to access the mainstream curriculum. Can you clarify your point on how these children might best learn English please? Well best learning English I think they need to maintain their first language obviously and if you can begin learning in your first language in a school and then assimilating by actually learning the second language that is fantastic my concern around that are resources and how that is made available. Um, local authorities many years ago used to have people going in to support the acquisition of language and there was an awful lot of support. Um, I don't, I think that that's not there now. I, I don't think that that's in existence in many local authorities. So, you know, basically you don't ever want to lose your first language. And if there was a facility for a child to be writing, reading in their own first language as they go into school, that's really, really vital in my view. So you need to actually be thinking about what books you've got, what resources you've got that you can, and there's a lot out there that you can download already. And things that the children may be bringing with them, they might have a favorite book that they be, bring with them as well. Um, I think that, you know, it's just common sense, isn't it? You, you need to actually maintain both your languages, but I think it's, it's bit by bit, and it's gonna be very different for each individual child. Some of the children that I've spoken to speak really, really good English already. Um, and that's a blessing for them because it does make that transition far more, um, far less stressful, I should say, in terms of interacting and making new friends. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really important because, you know, 
understanding the system, how it works here, there are differences and, and that is also going to be something that I think maybe needs to be translated for the parents of the refugee children coming in. And in fact, on that point, Catherine Brennan's just put in um, about Ukrainian parents understanding the English education system. And there are apparently some guidance documents from the Bell Foundation, which are free, and they have been translated into Ukrainian. And um, Catherine's given us the, um, the web link. And I think probably we'll be gleaning all of the web links from the chat where they're supportive of the message that you've been putting out this, this evening, Tina. Yeah, yeah. Tony Mancini has asked a question about, he firstly thanks you for the wonderful webinar, but have you got any tips about supporting situations where a refugee child from Ukraine joins a class with a child who has Russian heritage? Well, this is the thing that I, <laughs> I raised in the presentation, the sensitivities around all of this. I think it's about preparing both children. It's about having those maybe difficult conversations around how to approach this, talking to both families as well, because it's not necessarily going to be the case that there is friction. We need to remember that. We need to remember that many of us are very, very rational and many of us understand what the situation really is on the ground. And many of my Russian colleagues and friends certainly do. There are others that don't. So I think, again, it's about that whole sensitivity thing. What would you do in any other circumstances if children were racist, homophobic, sexist, if they displayed behaviours that were inappropriate towards each other, that were unkind, not compassionate, that were cruel, that were based on prejudice and, 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 and other things that we, we really would call out in a school. Think about that, think about it in those terms and how you would manage that because we do have systems and protocols in place. We do know how to talk kids through this and engage in conflict management. So very, very important. And it's not necessarily going to have to be an issue. So remember that too. Sometimes I think we try and preempt it, but planning helps. If you know what you would do in those situations, I think you can transfer those skills and that knowledge base or those strategies to this kind of situation too, to some extent. Mm. Rachel is asking, Tina, how would you suggest teachers prepare the other children to welcome refugee children? I think it would be a lovely idea to talk about what a refugee is, to, to, to read them some stories, because there's a lot of literature out there. I know Sarah, who's on this call today, um, Johnson, I think she's been developing some lovely stories and there are books, uh, resources that can be read to children about the experiences of refugee children. And that's a really good starting point, real, real stories, stories from other kids who've experienced this and what that meant and how they felt. Um, so I would suggest that, but I'd also be thinking about how you engage with those children coming in. And if you are one of the children in the class, maybe think about the circle of friends approach, which is so lovely. It was designed to support children with so-called um, antisocial um, aspects to their behaviours and to try and include them and modify their behaviours in old fashioned behaviours terms. But actually this notion of having a circle of friends who are there to support, to play, have specific roles about buddying up in terms of learning, taking them out to teach them things, um, taking them out to teach them games in the playground, etc. being there if they got upset, going to the calm corner with them, reading a story together, etc. That is also something that I think could be prepped in a, an initial session. You can identify those children and young people too. That makes sense. Yes, it does. And, and um, to add to that, Andrea Thomas has pointed out that some LAs provide support with language acquisition and development. And it's worth looking on the local offer pages to see what might be available locally. And um, that's obviously going to vary from region to region, yeah. but I think that's a, a good point, uh, um, Angela, for us to, to follow through. Yeah, um, can I point out to everybody, there's some fabulous things coming through um, on the chat. Um, again, lots of, of um, affirmations of things that you're saying. There's lots of nodding people, apparently, <laughs> as we're going through. Um, Kerry's just suggested maybe a circle of friends and that builds on your buddying um, idea as, as well. Uh, and Isabel's saying, you know, language is a powerful tool to include the whole class, maybe using morning greetings in the register in, in both languages, in Ukrainian as well, for the English children to learn some Ukrainian. I think that's what your posters were very much uh, signaling up. I'm conscious we're coming to the end of 
the session for today and I think I should pull things together now. Um, certainly, obviously, Tina, without a doubt, saying a huge, huge thank you to you. There was a phrase you used about, about compassionate relationships uh, and you in your presentation this evening have certainly shown us huge compassion. Um, but extending that, that theme of compassion, you've shown us how we can use teaching as a vehicle compassionate teaching and I I know John Reed is on the call this evening and John's soon to be submitted doctorate is on the whole thing about compassion in teaching and we need to remind ourselves that the very essence at this point of time whatever activity we've looked at whatever suggestion you've made it's about delivering that with kindness it is the kindness in your eyes the kindness that your body posture represents almost embracing and that doesn't always have to be physical that child as a learner welcoming that child and just by your very actions that child knowing they're a welcome part of your school community of your class community and that you value them as, as an individual i think the pandemic stripped us down to our basic humanity our shared humanity and i think this situation is going to yet again demand that humanity but a phrase i often use but i'm going to use one more time can we remind ourselves that teaching is a relationship-based profession? People are worried about academic pressures. Um, if you listen to Amanda Spielman today about the, the, what they're seeing in very young children, there is a real worry and concern. And maybe for once we just need to stand up for children and override the political demands and say this is not appropriate and we are not doing it. We need to be there for these children. They need some degree of protection as do our children that have been through the wretchedness of a pandemic too. And I think this is a, a turning point for teaching, to taking it back to being truly a relationship-based profession. Because schools are places of warmth and of compassion. Educators are people. And that's why teaching is a relationship-based profession. Thank you for the power of your relationship, Tina, and the, and the teaching you've given us this evening. Your shared wisdom has been a real treasure for all of us. Thank you all for attending, for the dynamic way you've interacted with this webinar. Um, as Alan said at the beginning, we're going to be posting uh, the presentation, the recording of the presentation, and the resources that Tina's uh, articulated for us, but also other resources that you've suggested as we've gone along. And you'll see there's a slide up now, just once more, giving you the uh, website reference for evidence for learning. If you want to hear more from Dr. Tina Ray, don't forget that there is actually a webinar that she's recorded for the new Learning Shared series, and you may want to look that up too. Thank you for the time this evening, everyone. Safe journey home, and we hope that you have a good evening. Stay in touch. Thank you.